Hello and welcome at our GCP Mindset channel. Today we speak about a very interesting topic. We speak about non-interventional studies and we speak about the regulatory point of view on this topic. And uh, I have invited Andreas Kors, an expert in regulatory for this topic. Thank you for inviting me here, Andreas. Hello, Andreas. Thank you very much for being here to speak with me about the topic non-interventional studies. For some people, it sounds probably a little bit boring um, because they don't consider non-interventional studies as really scientifically challenging. But from the regulatory point of view, I think they are quite complicated. Yeah. But let's start with yourself. Uh, what makes you a regulatory manager? What makes you an expert in non-interventional studies? Well, uh, after studying biology and neurobiology, I then started working in the industry um, as a regulatory affairs manager for several years. And actually, the time where I started was uh, couldn't be more and more exciting to enter this field because it was uh, during the transition period from the previous um, the directives, which were not um, binding legally, into the new regulations, which are now um, legally binding within the EU. So I had to learn both the, the old um, directions, the new regulations, and all the traditional periods, which was really interesting. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's probably a good time to, to start with something when everything is a movement and a change. Uh, I experienced the same in 2004 already when I founded the, my first company and everything was in change and everything new, all the information were overloading for the business, but it's a good starting time. Yeah. Uh, but coming back to a non-interventional study and I uh, teasered here already a little bit that it's quite complicated. What, what makes it so complicated? Yeah, as, as already explained, um, we have the new regulations, the NDR for medical devices, the CTR for um, um, pharmaceuticals, and they tried to, to standardize the conduct and submission of clinical trials within or clinical studies within the EU. However, all these new regulations, they om mostly omit the non-interventional clinical studies. And therefore, we still have a, a big patchwork of local applicable laws depending on the EU country. And even within the countries, there sometimes the laws omit these non-interventional um, studies, which is why the regulation is not really clear and it's more a kind of gray area. Okay. And is it for both for drug studies and for medically biased studies? Yeah, for both, it's uh, more of a patchwork. However, one could say that um, generally the, the drug studies are stronger regulated than the medical device studies, I would say, which kind of reflects also the, the point we had before uh, the, uh, um, the MDR that medical devices were not so strongly regulated as the uh, pharmaceuticals. Okay, but today we speak about non-interventional studies in drugs, right? Yes. Okay, according to my understanding, actually the EU regulations don't really contain rules for non-interventional studies. But what is the reason then why people want to conduct non-interventional studies? So what is the purpose of non-interventional studies? Well, that is actually an interesting uh, question because um, the non-interventional studies sometimes are referred to as a kind of marketing tool. However, um, one shouldn't, should, shouldn't um, say this for all uh, non-interventional studies because there are several different types. There are, for example, also some non-interventional studies that are required actually by the competent authorities to gain um, the marketing authorization, kind of conditional um, non-interventional studies that must be done. And uh, these non-interventional studies are, are a good tool actually to um, gather more additional data, for example, safety data in the real environment, how the, the drugs or medical devices are used in the long run. So actually the competent authority approved a product, it's allowed to be on the market already, but still there's a requirement for the manufacturer to do a non-intervention study? Yes, um, a good example is for, are, for example, the, the recent um, uh, COVID um, vaccines, which were developed in a really short time period and there was not enough time to, to generate long-term safety data and therefore, but the, the 
because they were really needed on the market, um, they got approved with such a condition that additional safety data is gathered in the long run, which then usually can be done in such a non-interventional study. Okay, that makes sense. But not every non-interventional study is required by a competent authority. Yes, there are, the sponsor is also able to do a non-interventional study um, because he wants to collect additional data. And there is one uh, subtype of interventional studies which actually got a bit of a negative connotation because um, and, and therefore was um, called a kind of marketing tool because um, some studies on such non-interventional clinical studies showed that the prescription rate uh, by the PIs raised uh, um, for this um, pharmaceutical, even though the laws clearly say it should not be that the prescription rate raises if an IMP is part of a non-interventional study. Yeah, actually the raise of a prescription means already there is a kind of intervention. Yes, yeah. I would say so. Yeah. And I think here are also uh, some differences between medically advised non-interventional studies and pharmaceutically non-interventional studies. Uh, because of term intervention, there, there we have different interpretations. What does it mean for a drug study, an intervention? And the term intervention is uh, not clearly explained in the laws or regulations because the regulations are lacking a bit. And therefore, it's interpreted a bit different, depending also on the, on the type of interve or type of examination, and also on the type of uh, of the country which uh, study is per, um, conducted in. So, for example, one example between medical device studies and um, IMP studies in some countries, like Germany or Austria, um, for example, is that a randomization per se is not a problem for medical device studies if the risk um, benefit profile is comparable between both products. However, for um, pharmaceuticals, randomization is a no-go because the new clinical trials regulation clearly states as soon as you randomize the treatment, you don't have a non-interventional study anymore, but uh, a new type called um, low-interventional clinical trial, which then must be submitted via the new EU portal, the CETES portal, and does not count as non-intervention anymore. Yeah. This doesn't make so much sense when it's for a drug study different compared to a medical device study. Um, but I, of course, I can understand that randomization is not a normal prescription process mm -hmm. uh, because then we don't need to have the judgment of a medical doctor anymore when we can randomize treatments. Uh, but actually, it should be the same for medical devices. Do, do you uh, agree? A kind of, and actually other people are seeing it the same. So there are countries like um, Czech, Re Czech Republic or Poland, which actually are more strict. And they say if a medical device study is randomized, they also don't um, call it non-interventional anymore, but see this as an intervention already. Okay. Um, so there is are different views. And I think the, the, the regulators have to, to work a bit there to, to standardize it a bit more or yeah. it would be a good op option to do that. Yeah, but it seems that regula uh, regulators are not really interested in non-interventional studies because otherwise the regulation would also consider non-interventional studies. I th I, yeah, that might be. Yeah. yeah. A question I receive quite often from clients is, uh, can we use questionnaires for a non-interventional study? How do you see that from the regulatory point of view? Um, so questionnaires generally can be used. So they are often accepted by the ethics committees when you submit such a study. However, there you can also cross a borderline if you have too many questions and the, the, the time, for example, that the patient has to needs for filling out these questionnaires is too much then you can cross this borderline and you don't have a non-interventional study anymore. Okay. It's again the question if we interpret it as harm and discomfort for the patient and too many questionnaires would be considered a discomfort. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you talked already about differences between Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, Poland. Uh, very interesting. But what would you recommend to a sponsor who plans a non-interventional study and they don't know exactly in which country they should go? What should they keep in mind? Yeah, generally, I would um, suggest a sponsor to, to not shy away from seeking help early in the planning of such a study. 
for example, um, asking a, C a more experienced CRO because uh, because it's no, not so good regulated and it's often gray area and so on. Um, if you have a specific question, there are also usually ways where you can um, force a competent authority or the ethics committee to ask them a question and they have to to decide if a decision is, for example, an examination and an intervention or not. And I would also recommend sponsors to, to choose countries for their non-interventional studies where the, there is a good infrastructure, um, the, there's a low corruption going on, and also where the regulatory pathway is quite transparent. Okay. When you speak about countries, generally, would you recommend to go into several countries or would you keep it in one country? Um, actually, it sometimes makes sense to keep it in one country because then you only have to make the decision is it an intervention, yes or no, once and you can have differences there yeah? because a rule of thumb is that everything that is additional to standard of care is considered an intervention but depending on the country, not the standard of care is not the same so you have different standard of cares and so if you design a, a non-interventional study it might be considered interventional in one country and non-interventional in another. So this yeah. has to be decided previously. Yeah. Okay. Very good topic. Then let's ask the question a little bit differently. What should be avoided when they plan a non-interventional study? Yeah. Um, one tip I could give there is um, because um, the non-interventional studies also gained a bit of negative connotation because there was like um, misplanning for a lot of these studies in the recent years um, because they, for example, did not correct statistical planning. And then in the end, they conducted the studies, but uh, it, they were not able to show what the study should show. And therefore, I would um, make a proper planning. And this is something uh, so wrong planning or misplanning should be avoided. Yeah. Could, could it be the reason that uh, the, the complexity of a non-interventional study is very often underestimated? Yeah, I, I really think that that might be, might be the case. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that's a very good recommendation for, for people who plan a non-interventional study. Never ever underestimate the complexity of a non-interventional study, especially from the regulatory point of view, because the variation of rules is so differently even in, in the region EU. Yeah, yeah. Andreas, thank you very much for your insight into the topic non-interventional study, especially from the regulatory point of view. Uh, I think you are right, it's complex uh, because of the variation of rules uh, and it's therefore also very interesting. Yeah. 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 I hope also that you liked our video, that you considered it interesting. Um, leave your comments. Send us your questions. See you the next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.